Uh, from the Department of Politics and International Studies at Warwick University, um, please, Rebecca, uh, please welcome Rebecca Riley Cooper, who's going to talk about um, politics and gender identity this evening. Thank you very much. Give a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. How's that sound? Is that all right? Okay, let me know if it gets too loud or too quiet. Hey, well, thank you, and um, thank you to Dave and to Kat and the Coventry Skeptics for inviting me. Thank you to the Twisted Barrel for having us. Thank you all for coming. It's so lovely to see so many people. I was not expecting such a large audience. So this topic that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, the topic of the nature of gender, the concept of gender identity, and the social and political implications of that idea, that's a topic that I've been researching and writing about for about two years now, maybe a little bit more. But despite that, it's a subject that I very rarely talk about in public. In fact, I try and avoid talking about it in public if I possibly can. And if you know anything about this topic, if you know anything about how these debates usually play out, you might understand why I usually try and avoid talking about this subject in public if I can. This is a topic that is, generally speaking, incredibly fraught, incredibly emotive. Uh, the debate is often intemperate and uncharitable, sometimes downright hostile and abusive, on all sides, I would say, right? And so trying to tread a careful and nuanced path through all of that is not for the faint-hearted. In addition, what I would say is I think some interested parties to this debate have attempted to portray all disagreement with their view as inherently bigoted, right? as discriminatory and oppressive by definition. So that view, that's the view that I am here calling the doctrine of gender identity, and I'm going to go on to explain what I mean by the doctrine of gender identity. That view is portrayed by, I think, a minority of activists as the only morally permissible view to take on the subject of the nature of gender. So all and any dissent from this doctrine is presented as in itself bigoted and oppressive, even violent, right? In and of itself. So what we're told is, look, if you want to avoid being complicit in the stigmatization and oppression of a marginalized group, you have to accept this doctrine in its entirety. Indeed, even asking the kinds of questions that I'm going to be asking tonight, even critically examining this doctrine and seeing if it stands up to scrutiny, that is in itself, we are told by some people, an act of oppression, maybe even violence, against a stigmatized and marginalized group. And so if you want to avoid perpetrating that oppression, the only thing you can do is accept the doctrine in its entirety, without any question or without critical reflection. So just to illustrate that point, there's just one example. This is a panel that I have taken from a comic strip that was hosted on possibly my least favorite website in the world. That website is everydayfeminism.com. This comic strip is called Let's Be Clear, My Gender Identity is Harmless, and it contained this panel. I don't know if you can read that at the back. If you can't, I'll tell you what he's saying. Here we have the protagonist of the comic saying, you don't have to like my gender identity, but if you don't respect it, then you don't respect me. Now, that's a very commonly held piece of dogma, I think, that showing respect for people requires respecting their gender identity and requires believing the story that they tell themselves about their own identity. So I think the people trying to prevent scrutiny of this doctrine have been reasonably successful in presenting the view in that way. And insofar as they have, I think debate around the topic of the nature of gender is, is, is stalled, is being set back. However, quite obviously, because I'm here tonight talking to you about it, I do not accept this view. Right? I do not accept the portrayal of all critical examination of this doctrine as inherently bigoted. And I do not believe that in order to respect you as a person, I have to respect every aspect of your identity or believe every aspect of the story you tell yourself about that identity. Now, I think that becomes clear when you swap out the word gender in this picture for any other kind of identity. If you have a religious belief that incorporates the notion that you are one of God's chosen people, I don't have to respect that belief 
in order to respect you as a person. If you're a white supremacist who thinks that the lack of melanin in your skin equates to some genetic superiority, and if that belief in your own racial superiority forms a central part of your identity, well, I don't have to share that belief in your own racial superiority in order to respect you as a person and show you the decency and humanity you are nonetheless owed as a person. I don't have to respect your belief that you're an incredibly talented singer and dancer in order to respect you as a person, right? The same is true for gender identity. I can respect you as a person. I can treat you decently. I can uphold your rights. I can affirm your humanity without needing to believe the story that you tell yourself about your gender identity. Now, I've been reading endlessly around this topic. I've been researching it in depth. Now, I've come to the sincere belief that this doctrine that I'm presenting here tonight is not only incoherent, but it's also harmful and damaging. Crucially, I'm saying it's harmful and damaging to everybody, but especially to those marginalized and oppressed people it claims to be helping. So I think that we're not just permitted, but we are obligated to ask these kinds of critical questions about the doctrine. We're obligated to expose it to scrutiny. So I say all of this, all of this preamble is not intended as an apology for asking the questions that I'm asking tonight or for coming to the conclusions that I've come to, but simply to ask that if you are listening to me now, already convinced that you disagree with everything I'm going to say, that you'll nonetheless listen with an open mind, extend me the principle of charity, and even if I get to the end and you're still convinced that I'm wrong about everything, which you are absolutely entitled to do, I hope that you'll at least be able to acknowledge that I raise these questions not out of prejudice or bigotry, but out of a sincere belief that this doctrine about the nature of gender is false and damaging to everybody. So, what is this view, this view that I'm calling the doctrine of gender identity? As I see it, it's got a couple of different elements. So can you read that at the back? So firstly, the first element of this doctrine is what I'm calling the concept of gender identity. What I want to do is I want to scrutinize this concept. I want to critically examine its philosophical coherence. I want to examine its internal logic and consistency. And I want to try to determine whether the concept of gender identity, as it is used and understood by adherence to the doctrine, whether it's actually conceptually coherent. Now, this is a task that's actually made very difficult by the fact that most of the people who use the phrase, most of the people who adhere to the doctrine, never actually define the term gender identity, and they often don't appear to have a very clear idea themselves of what they mean by it. The definitions that you find in the literature are usually either entirely circular, entirely question-begging, or alternatively, they're usually reliant on socially constructed stereotypes about the behaviors and preferences of men and women. So part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to describe the features that the idea of gender identity must have if it's going to do the work that proponents of the doctrine need it to do. In other words, what I'm trying to do is determine what the concept of gender identity must entail from other aspects of the doctrine and other things that proponents of the doctrine say, because their own definitions tend not to be very helpful on that score. And then the question I want to ask is, well, is this concept philosophically coherent? Can it logically contain the features it pro its proponents need it to contain? Or do the various assumptions about it end up being inconsistent with one another and render it incoherent? You can probably tell by the way I've asked that question. You can probably guess what my answer to that is. And then a related question, which I which I think is important that we try to answer, but which I freely and fully recognize my own inability to answer, is the question of whether the concept of gender identity is compatible with our scientific knowledge and with our best understanding of the facts about sex and gender. As I say, that's a question I can't answer. I can only begin to explore it. What I can do, what I am qualified to do, is to highlight some of the empirical assumptions that might be at work in some versions of the doctrine. I can highlight some of the scientific claims that the doctrine might rely upon. I'm not qualified because I'm not a scientist, so I'm not qualified to make any pronouncements about whether these scientific claims are actually true. That's for smarter people than me to do. But what I can do is illuminate the kind of things that would have to be true if this concept is going to make sense. 
The doctrine's got a second element. It's associated identity politics, what I'm calling the politics of gender identity. So here I'm interested in the question, well, what are the social, cultural, and political implications of the doctrine of gender identity? Now, these are wide ranging, they're hugely significant, there's many of them. I can't begin to talk about them all here. So I think some of it will probably come out in our discussion, in our Q&A, so I'll leave a lot of that to talk about in the discussion. But I do think it's important that we're at least able to ask the question, is this an attractive, defensible political theory? Does the politics of gender identity present us with laws and policies that actually operate to benefit the groups they're supposed to benefit? and that actually represent a fair and reasonable balance among competing interests. As I say, I won't really be able to touch on that very much, but I think it will come out in our discussion. The first thing I should quickly do is explain why this is something we ought to care about to begin with. Right? Because if you're sitting here and you don't know very much about this issue or the influence that these debates are ha currently having on policy and legislation, you might reasonably now be thinking, okay, so some people hold a view about gender that Rebecca disagrees with. Some people are wrong on the internet, so what? Right? And that would be a reasonable view. But what I wanna show is that the doctrine of gender identity is actually currently enjoying a significant amount of social, political, and cultural momentum. And in some cases, it is resulting in legislative changes. So in many jurisdictions now, laws are being introduced to protect individuals from discrimination or harassment on the basis of their gender identity. So I want to have a quick look at some of these just to, just to prove that point to you. These are a couple of states that are commonly held by proponents of this doctrine as models, as exemplars, examples to be followed because of their gender identity legislation. So first we had Argentina in 2012, and that was followed by Malta in 2015. These two states both passed gender identity laws. These laws state that all persons have the right to the recognition of their gender identity, to the free development of their person according to their gender identity, to be treated according to their gender identity, and particularly to be identified in that way in documents proving their identity. So that's the wording of the Argentinian legislation. The Maltese legislation is almost identical, except it punctuates slightly differently. In the United States, it varies from state to state, but a number of states have incorporated gender identity into their laws as a characteristic on the basis of which it's prohibited to discriminate against people. So these states include California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota. These laws protect individuals from discrimination in a variety of arenas, including employment, education, and housing, all on the basis of the individual's gender identity. There have been a couple of attempts to enshrine and protect the notion of gender identity into international human rights law. And these have been influential in shaping some of this national legislation. So first we have what's called the Yogyakarta Principles. These are principles on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. These principles were developed in 2007, and the aim was to apply human rights law specifically to issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. So these principles haven't been adopted by states in a treaty. So they're not by themselves legally binding, they're not part of international human rights law, but these principles have been, they're intended to serve as an interpretive aid to human rights treaties, and they're seen by many people as representing a universal standard to which states should aspire. And they've been very influential in shaping the legislation in places like Argentina, Malta, and Ireland. The principles state that states shall adopt appropriate legislative and other measures to prohibit and eliminate discrimination in the public and private spheres on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. States shall take all necessary legislative, administrative, and other measures to fully respect and legally recognize each person's self-defined gender identity. Then there are 29 principles in the, in the document covering a range of human rights issues and explicitly stating that individuals should be protected on the basis of their gender identity. Then we've got Resolution 2048 of the Council of Europe. This was adopted by the Council in 2015. 
The, states, the Assembly calls on member states to explicitly prohibit discrimination based on gender identity in national non-discrimination legislation and include the human rights situation of transgender people in the mandate of national human rights institutions with an explicit reference to gender identity to provide effective pro uh, protection against discrimination on grounds of gender identity and access to employment and the public and private sectors and, ex and in access to housing, justice and healthcare. In the UK, as you may know, the current legal situation is that the notion of gender identity is not yet enshrined or recognized in law. The relevant current legislation is the Equality Act of 2010. This prohibits discrimination in the provision of a range of goods and services on the basis of a number of protected characteristics. The characteristics that are currently recognized and protected that are relevant here are firstly, sex, and secondly, gender reassignment. So in the UK, people are currently protected from discrimination on the basis of their being or their being perceived to be a member of a particular biological sex, or on the basis of their undergoing or being perceived to be undergoing a process of gender reassignment. That's the current state of play in the UK. However, if certain members of the current government get their way, that will change. So last year, the Women and Equalities Select Committee, which was chaired by Conservative MP Maria Miller, held an inquiry into transgender equality. They published a report at the start of this year, and that report recommended that the protected characteristic in respect of trans people under the Equality Act should be amended to that of gender identity. This would improve the law by bringing the language in the Act up to date, making it compliant with the Council of Europe Resolution 2048, and make it significantly clearer that protection is afforded to anyone who might experience discrimination because of their gender identity. So, given all of this, all this legislation, you might hope that the concept of gender identity would have a clear and easily understood definition. If we are going to enshrine laws upholding people's rights to have their gender identity protected and respected, and especially when those laws come into conflict with, or in some cases effectively override, existing legal protections that are already in place for other groups, if we're going to do that, you would hope that there would be some meaningful and comprehensible definition of what gender identity actually is. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Certainly none of these documents, and indeed very little of the theoretical literature, manage to define the concept of gender identity in a way that is not either narrowly circular or, or not reliant on particular contingent socially constructed stereotypes about what men and women are. And as a result of that, they don't really show us why we should take this as a characteristic of individuals that need special protection. So I'm going to take a look at some of the definitions we find in these laws and principles. So first of all, we've got the Yogyakarta Carta principles. Remember the Yogyakarta Carta principles, these are supposed to be the standard, these are the gold standard of it, uh, for, for the treatment of trans people in international human rights law. The Yogyakarta Carta principles define gender identity as gender identity is understood to refer to each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. And that's basically identical to how the Argentinian and Maltese legislation define it because they drew on Yogyakarta Carta for their definitions. So Maria Miller's report, the Select Committee's report, went for the brief and rather unhelpful. Gender identity is the gender with which persons associate themselves. That's echoed in a very minimal definition from the NHS. Gender identity is the gender that a person identifies with or feels themselves to be. Finally, on these lines, I'm including this just for amusement, really. This is my favorite. For the mo this is, we find the utterly useless definitions enshrined in the statutes of many American states. I've taken this one from Massachusetts, but there are many that are the same. So in Massachusetts, we're told that gender identity shall mean a person's gender-related identity. Appearance or behavior, whether or not that gender-related identity, appearance or behavior, is different from that traditionally associated with the person's physiology or assigned sex at birth. I, mean, I love that, right? Gender identity shall mean a person's gender-related identity. That's what it says in the legislation in Massachusetts, right? 
What should hopefully be clear about all of these definitions when you look at them is that the word gender appears on both sides, both as part of the thing to be defined and as part of the definition itself. And thus they are perfectly narrowly circular definitions. No attempt is made in any of these definitions to tell us what the word gender means. So Maria Miller's Select Committee published a 98-page report examining issues of gender inequality. Nowhere once in that document does it define the word gender. And I know because I read the whole thing and I looked for it, there was no definition of the word gender in that document. In these definitions, we do get some sense that identity might mean something like a deeply felt internal and individual experience or something that one associates with, something that one feels oneself to be even leaving aside the fact that it doesn't define gender. And so therefore, because it doesn't define gender, it doesn't tell us in what sense this feeling or this association is different from other feelings people might have that have nothing to do with gender. Even leaving aside that, that's a very thin and inadequate definition of what a gender identity is. It tells us that it's a deeply felt internal and individual experience or a strong feeling. But it doesn't tell us anything about where this feeling comes from, what its relationship is to our bodies and to our biological sex. It doesn't tell us anything about what this, relate, this feeling's relationship is to our upbringing, our environment, our culture. It certainly doesn't, on its own, give us any grounds to explain why this deeply held feeling should be taken as so sacrosanct that it needs to be afforded special legal protections. Now, I think that's significant, given that these protections that are being recommended will sometimes conflict with or override already existing protections in place for people on the basis of their sex or going through a process of gender reassignment. I find this genuinely extraordinary, that laws can be proposed and enacted to enshrine and protect a characteristic of human identity, that none of those people drafting the legislation either can or can be bothered to define properly. The preamble to the Yogi Carta principles claims that individuals will experience violence, harassment, exclusion, stigmatization, and prejudice because of their gender identity. Now, if that's true, that gives us a reason to take it seriously as a need of protection. But it's not clear how it can be true on their own definition of what gender identity is, since it's not clear how anyone can suffer discrimination or violence solely on the basis of a deeply felt internal sensation rather than on the outward expression and presentation of that sensation. In terms of some slightly more useful, slightly less circular definitions, we do a little bit better if we look at some organizations that represent transgender individuals and their working definitions. So for example, if we look at GLAAD, the American organization that was formerly known as the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation until they broadened their remit, they define gender identity like this. They say gender identity is a person's internal, personal sense of being a man or a woman or someone outside of that gender binary. This is the key part for me, they say. Trying to change a person's gender identity is no more successful than trying to change a person's sexual orientation. It doesn't work. I've highlighted that because I think it's important and I'll come back to it. So most transgender people seek to bring their bodies more into alignment with their gender identity. The British organization, the Gender Identity Research and Education Society, defines it thus. Gender identity describes the psychological definition of oneself, typically as a boy or man, or as a girl or woman. Some people experience a gender identity that is somewhat or, or completely inconsistent with, the sex appear with their sex appearance. Or they may regard themselves as gender neutral or non-gender, or as embracing aspects of both man and woman and possibly falling on a spectrum between the two. And they say, people have the right to self-identify. Now, despite the fact that this is a term that's actually currently enjoying a great deal of cultural and political momentum, the concept of gender identity has actually been around in psychology and medicine since at least the 1960s. So this is when the issue of people who experienced a conflict between their professed gender identity and their socially recognized gender first started to come to the attention of medical professionals who had, for the first time, had the ability to do something about it. The current American Psychological Association definition, this is taken from the DSM-5, 
describes gender identity as a category of social identity and refers to an individual's identification as male, female, or occasionally some category other than male or female. One of the early definitions in the psychological literature, this comes from Robert Stoller, professor of psychiatry at UCLA Medical School. He was researcher in their gender identity clinic. I think this is a useful definition for our purposes here. He says, gender identity is a complex system of beliefs about oneself, a sense of one's masculinity and femininity. It implies nothing about the origins of that sense, e.g. whether the person is male or female, it has then the psychological connotations only one subjective state. So I think these definitions are marginally more useful in that they at least invoke words other than gender to define gender, but not much more useful since as you can see, they're still appealing to inherently gendered words, boy, man, girl, woman, without telling us what it might mean to have an internal, personal sense of yourself as man or woman, male or female. How can I know if I have an internal, personal sense of myself as those things if I don't know what those words actually mean? So I think that last definition is crucial. The notion of gender identity, which seems to mean something like a deeply felt, strong sense of one's association or identification as a man or a woman, but it tells us nothing the concept of gender identity tells us nothing about where this sense actually comes from, what the process is by which we acquire one, and what its relationship is to our sexed bodies. Now, I think that matters. Because if we're going to be told that this feeling is something which is so important, it must be enshrined in law, that it needs to be afforded special protections, even where those protections override protections already in place for the people, then I think we need to know where do these feelings come from? What is their relationship to our bodies? I think we are owed some account of why these feelings are so important. After all, I have many deeply felt senses about myself and my own identity that nobody considers worthy of special legal protections. So I want to know what's so special about this one. I think we're owed that answer. Since the literature on the subject is so unhelpful and doesn't actually ever manage to define gender identity in a way that we can have a clear idea what it is, I think the only option left for us is to try to ascertain what kind of a property or what kind of a phenomenon it might be from other things that proponents of the doctrine of gender identity say about it and from the role that it plays in the doctrine as a whole. So in what follows, I'm not necessarily going on what proponents of the doctrine have actually said in their definitions of gender identity. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to determine what features the concept of gender identity needs to have if it's going to play the role in the doctrine they need it to play. And from then we can go on to think about whether that's, whether that's plausible. So I've got no doubt that many people who believe in gender identity will, try, will deny that it has the features I'm about to say it has. My claim is that, but it has to, if it's going to do the work you need it to do. So, the first relevant feature about the notion of gender identity is that it needs to be a universal phenomenon. All individuals are said to possess a gender identity. If you think that you don't have one, that's because you're cisgender, and thus, you've never had to question yours. You've never had to think about it. You've always just been able to take it for granted, but nonetheless, you do have one. So this is not just a thing that some people have, it's a thing that everybody has. And even though some people might deny having one, they're mistaken. You might feel that you don't have one, but you do. We're not permitted to opt out of having a gender identity, according to the doctrine. I know because I've tried. I've said, I, I don't think I have this thing. I don't know what it might mean. And I was accused of denying my cisgender privilege, of trying to pathologize transgender identities by portraying myself as normal and trans people as deviant, which is absolutely not what I'm trying to do. And I received this response all because I said, I don't think I have this thing. I don't have a deep internal personal sense of myself as a woman. I call myself a woman, it's true, I think I'm a woman, but it's not because, in some sense, deep down, I feel like one. I call myself a woman because I'm female. I have a body that has female sex characteristics. I have uter a uterus and ovaries. I have breasts and a vagina. 
And because my understanding of the word woman was that it referred to an adult human female, an adult of the female sex of the species Homo sapiens, I thought, okay, so that makes me a woman. But the proponent of gender identity says to me, no, no, those things don't make you a woman. Those things don't make you a woman, your breasts, your vagina, your uterus, your ovaries, those things don't make you a woman because some of the people who have those things don't identify as women. And some of the people who have those things identify as men. So having breasts and a vagina, they say, can't make you a woman. So if you're really a woman, they said to me, it must be because you identify as one. You must, it must be because you have the gender identity woman. Or in my case, as a female person, cisgender woman. So I'm told that my biology and my physiology are irrelevant to the fact that I'm a woman, whether or not I accept that. The thing that makes me a woman is that I identify as one. So I have the gender identity woman, whether I believe I do or not, and it's an act of cisgender privilege, it's an act of oppression for me to deny that I do. So one possible response to this, if you find that unattractive, is to say, okay, okay, so maybe you don't have this thing, this gender identity. Maybe there are different ways of being a woman. Maybe there's more than one way of becoming a woman. Maybe some women are women because they are born in female bodies and they're raised and socialized to be women. And maybe other people become women, could become women by having this thing that I don't think I have namely the gender identity woman, the deeply held subjective sense of my, of, or feeling of oneself as a woman. But that's a non-starter for the proponent of the doctrine, right? The proponent of the doctrine can't accept that view. They do not want to allow that there can be more than one way of becoming a man or a woman. All people who are women must be women in the same way, for the same reasons. Otherwise, if we had other definitions of gender, this would leave room for some experiences of manhood or womanhood to be seen as more authentic than others. It would create different classes or types of women, where those who are women solely on the basis of their gender identity, they may not be seen as so completely women or as sufficiently women compared to those who have the female physiology. So for that reason, Gender identity needs to be the sole criterion for membership of the class of men or women. There cannot be any other way of becoming a man or a woman other than by identifying as one. So if you are sitting here and you think you're a woman, it must be because you possess the gender identity woman and no other reason. Any other reason you might have wanted to appeal to, to explain why you're a woman, that's irrelevant. What makes a person a woman is that she identifies as one. Nothing else. Nothing else is necessary. Nothing else is sufficient. So we can see gender identity has to be a universally experienced phenomenon because it has to be the case that everybody has one because this has to be the only way that men and women can come into existence. And since we know that nearly every human being on the planet can answer the question, are you a man or a woman? It must be the case that all of these individuals possess this property, the gender identity. I'm going to illustrate this. In the next few slides, I've got a few pictures taken from another of my least favorite websites, just to liven this up a bit. The next few pictures come from uh, a, a website called, um, a series of cartoons about gender identity called Assigned Male. Assigned Male features a trans child named Steffi. Here is one panel from an assigned male that illustrates the point I'm trying to make here. Oh, she hasn't come up. There she is, okay. So this is Steffi. Steffi is telling us that cisgender is an important word because biological men or women gives the idea that there are certain gender experiences that are more natural than some others. Steffi does not want that to be the case. She wants her experience of womanhood to be just as authentic and natural as the experience of those who are born with female physiology. Therefore, the only way, according to Steffi, that you can be a woman is to have the gender identity of woman. And then what it means to be cisgender is that you were lucky enough to happen to identify with the gender that you were assigned at birth. Now, I should say a handful of special people do get to opt out of being men or women by claiming to be something else, as we saw in a couple of our definitions on earlier slides. But even so, those people still have a gender identity. It's just that their gender identity is neither man nor woman, but something else. 
So when I said to people, I don't think I have this thing, I don't think I have a gender identity, I was told, oh, you do, you do. It sounds like you're agender. Your gender identity is agender, right? In other words, I was permitted to have the special gender identity, which is defined by the absence of gender. But I was not permitted to refuse to define my identity in gender terms at all. I either had to accept that I have the gender identity woman, or I could define myself as one of the rare and special agender people. But if I was to do that, if I was to call myself agender, that would involve giving up any claim on the word woman. I could no longer call myself a woman if I'm agender, right? But that's a word I've called myself my entire adult life, and I've called myself that my entire adult life because of my female body. So I'm now told that I, I have no claim to it, that I have no claim to call myself a woman unless I have this deep, internal, personal, subjective feeling of womanhood, which I don't have. But then, how can I know if I have this feeling if I don't actually know what this feeling is, if I don't actually know what it might mean to feel like a woman? So, if, it, if all it means, right, if all it means to have a deeply felt, subjective, personal sense of yourself as a, as a woman, or as a man or a woman, is that you think that your personality, your dispositions, your preferences are more closely aligned with the gender norms associated with one sex rather than the other, so if you, you have this strong feeling that you can survive and flourish more comfortably in one gender role than the other, if that's all it means, then I might say, okay, sure, yeah, it's plausible to say everybody has one of them. That's true, I've got one of them. I can live better as a woman than I can as a man now. Looking at the gender roles for men and the gender roles for women, I think I can conform better to the ones for women now. If, if, if all it means is that you, that you can look at the set of gendered traits and dispositions that are stereotypically associated with manhood, and you can look at the set of traits and dispositions that are stereotypically associated with, with womanhood, and think, okay, I think I can fit more closely into one of those boxes than the other, then you think my personality aligns more closely with one of those sets of character traits than the other, then sure, if that's what it means, I can accept that everyone has a gender identity. But the problem with that is that would tell us nothing about where this identity came from or even if it was necessarily a positive thing, right? It certainly wouldn't tell us why we should preserve it. It certainly shouldn't tell us why we should protect this feeling, even if it is a feeling that everyone has. Of course, I feel, when looking at the gender norms for manhood and looking at the gender norms for womanhood, of course I feel, yeah, I can live more tolerably and more comfortably as a woman than as a man. I've been raised for 34 years to do so. I've had a pretty comprehensive education in womanhood by this stage, pretty thorough training for that role. So it's no surprise, really, that looking at the pink box and looking at the blue box, I think, yeah, my personality probably fits better in the pink one now. And equally, I think that there might be lots of people who, of either sex who feel that they cannot squash their personality into the box associated with their sex. And so they come to feel that they can live more tolerably and more comfortably in the other one. And in that case, they might identify more strongly with the, the, the gender roles of the opposite sex. But it doesn't follow from any of this that gender identity is something that should ultimately be protected and respected. Because maybe it would be a better word if we just got rid of the pink, better world, if we just got rid of the pink and blue boxes altogether. Sure, I think we want to protect people from discrimination on the basis of their professed gender identity and how they express that gender identity. But that doesn't mean that gender identity is itself something to be protected and given special status in law. Maybe what we should be doing is aiming to create a world in which nobody needs to have a gender identity, since nobody would need to define themselves by reference to these two stereotypical personality types. Certainly nothing about that definition would require that we treat gender identity as sacrosanct or beyond critical examination, as the proponents of the doctrine would like us to do. So the point I'm trying to make there is, gender identity needs to be something more than just a strong affinity for, or a strong preference for, the things associated with masculinity or femininity. So here is the next feature that gender identity must possess, if it's going to do the work its proponents need it to do. It needs to be a relatively fixed, stable, and essential property of persons. What I mean by that is, 
It needs to be something more than just a strong preference or close affinity for the attributes and roles typically associated with masculinity or femininity. Otherwise, if, it's, if that was all it meant, its proponents couldn't tell us why it's sacrosanct. So in other words, they need to be positing the existence of an innate or essential property. The claim needs to be more than people who are raised in accordance with one set of values and beliefs about what it's appropriate for them to do come to endorse those values and beliefs. They need to be saying something more than that because that could just as easily be an argument for eradicating gender as it is for protecting it. So if you remember the definition of gender identity on a previous slide from GLAD, GLAD said, trying to change a person's gender identity is no more successful than trying to change a person's sexual orientation. It doesn't work. The, the proponents of the doctrine need to make that claim because otherwise it's not clear why it's wrong to question someone's gender identity or why we shouldn't try to shape and influence it, right? One of the central claims made by the proponents of the doctrine is that trying to shape or change someone's gender identity, perhaps encouraging them to question it, encouraging them to reflect on it, is seriously wrong, even abusive. So parallels are often drawn with psychiatric therapies from earlier periods that aimed at converting gay people or curing homosexuality. It's often explicitly argued that the only kind of psychological therapy for people who identify as transgender is one that affirms and supports their professed gender identity. Any other kind of therapy, even therapy for young people that simply advocates a let's wait and see how this all pans out kind of approach, that's considered dangerous and abusive. All of that, that only makes sense if you think that gender identity is in some sense fixed, fixed at quite a young age, perhaps even before birth. Because after all, one thing that we do know is that being transgender is often difficult, right? It causes pain and distress. It will often require painful, drawn out, invasive and expensive medical interventions to treat dysphoria. It's often accompanied by social intolerance, by prejudice, by stigma and discrimination. We know and we're often told that trans lives are difficult, maybe more difficult, and that they face a, great, a greater number of barriers and obstacles. But if that's so, if you know that those lives are difficult, why would you automatically privilege maintaining transgender identities over encouraging people to adopt an identity that is more in line with their birth sex. So here I'm quoting uh, the bioethicist Alice Drager. Alice Drager says, oh, I've missed a slide there. Alice Drager says, it's unclear why helping a female child become a boy is somehow a better clinical goal than helping a female child become a girl unless you de facto value transgender identity over cisgender identity. She goes on to say, if you're neutral on the identity outcome, and if you, what you're aiming to do is to reduce harms, then the evidence we have suggests that the best way to do that is to try to have a child end up happy with the body he or she was born with, because that will mean fewer invasive medical interventions. And only if that doesn't work should you actively aid in transition. So the only response that the proponent of gender identity can give to that is to say, well, we're not neutral on the identity outcome. And the reason they're not neutral on the identity outcome is because they believe that gender identity is a fixed and essential property, and therefore it can't be changed. And so any attempt to, change, to shape or influence or mold it in any way will inevitably fail, but will also cause damage to the individual. You might also think that it needs to be relatively fixed and essential. Otherwise, it's not clear why it should be afforded special protections. You might think it can't really be a matter of choice. It can't, we, this shouldn't be something we can opt in and opt out of, because if it were, you might think, well, why would it need special legal protections? So I think here proponents of gender identity are drawing on the success that the gay rights movement has had with born this way rhetoric. Right? And GLAD explicitly evokes that when it says, just as you can't change someone's sexual orientation, so you can't change their gender identity. I think it's a conscious attempt to follow that movement's success by presenting gender, ident presenting gender identity as something that's fixed, something that's essential, something that's pre-social. 
just as the gay rights movement has done with sexual orientation. So gender identity is something that must be seen as relatively fixed or permanent. I'm not really permitted to say, well, I'm, I feel like a woman today and I feel like a man tomorrow. Except a few people are permitted to do that. And they're the people who get to define themselves as gender fluid. But even for people who claim their gender is fluid, their gender fluidity is taken to be a fixed and essential fact about them, right? So even among people who claim that gender, their gender identity is fluid, that they can move along the spectrum, that is a given, essential, permanent fact about them. Either your gender is fluid or it is not. And they want to say, for most of you, it's not. For me, it is. My gender is fluid. I can move along the spectrum, but you can't. Right? You have to stay put. So being gender fluid is just as fixed and settled a gender identity as any other. Right? And furthermore, we can't all be gender fluid. Because if we could, the whole system of gender identity would break down. This belief that gender identity is fixed takes us to some weird places. It gets really weird really quick. And you have to believe this. We're told we have to believe this. So for example, the trans writer and activist Paris Lees claimed that Kelly Maloney has always been female. So Kelly Maloney was the former boxing promoter. Uh, she was earlier known as Frank Maloney. Kelly Maloney lived as Frank for 60 years, transitioned at the age of 60. But Paris Lees tells us that well, she's really always been female. Even for those 60 years she was living as Frank, she was always female. Um, that can only make sense if you think that gender identity is something essential that lives inside you, just waiting to be uncovered, waiting to emerge. You might not even know it's there, but it was really there inside you all along, your gender identity, and it will suddenly emerge, and you were always that thing all along. You want to have a very, very essentialist view about gender to think that, right? So here I've got an, another illustration from assigned male to illustrate that point. Here we've got Steffi again. Steffi is telling us, I'm not transitioning because I want to become a girl. I'm transitioning because I am a girl. Right? So the obvious question to ask Steffi is, well, then in what sense are you transitioning? And why? If you're already a girl, what are you transitioning from? What are you transitioning to? And why would you bother if you're already the thing that you've always been? The final feature that gender identity has to have if it's going to do the work it needs to do, or the final couple of features, well, first of all, it needs to be entirely independent of your sexed body. If it weren't, obviously, all people in male bodies would have a masculine gender identity, and all people in female bodies would have a feminine one. And of course, we know that that's not true. It's the very fact that this isn't true that creates the, the need for, to talk about gender identity at all. So it needs to be entirely independent of our sex bodies. So here we have Steffi saying, what do you mean I have boys' parts? Are you talking about my penis? Because it's mine and I'm a girl, so it's a girl's penis. So not only does, is Steffi's gender identity that of a girl, but that identity is, is not in any way shaped by her biology. More than that, her identity is the sole determining factor in how we should interpret and classify her biology. So penises become female if the person who owns it has a deep internal sensation of being a woman. In addition, gender identity needs to be entirely independent of our upbringing and of our gendered socialization. In other words, it needs to be an innate property. Because it, obviously, if it were not, then all people raised as boys would have a masculine gender identity, all people raised as girls would have a feminine one, and of course, again, we know that that's not true. So the result of all of that is, this is what gender identity has to be if it's going to do the work it needs to do. These are my findings. Gender identity must be a universally possessed, relatively fixed, essential and innate property of persons that is not reducible to biological sex and not determined by upbringing and socialization. So then, the next question to ask is, what kind of a property could it be? What kind of a thing could meet those conditions, right? Because that's, that's a big ask to try and identify what that thing might be. 
What kind of a property could meet these criteria? We've already seen it can't just be a person's personality, can't just be a taste and preferences, because otherwise it wouldn't be sacrosanct. It needs to be something more essential and innate than that. There's two main options here. There's two ways to go. I don't think either is very attractive. The, the two options are, well, it's either a material property or it's an immaterial property. If it's material in basis, what that means is it must be empirically verifiable. What I mean by that is it must be capable, at least in principle, if not yet in practice, of being observed and measured. There must be some way of testing, at least in principle of testing for the existence of this thing. There must be some tests we could perform to locate this property that we're calling gender identity. Now, I don't know what else that could possibly be except a gendered brain. So here we come back, we've got a gender, a gender bread man who is on the first slide. And here we're told the gender bread man, his gender identity absolutely lives in his brain. He's got a rainbow colored brain, which shows you that his gender identity is in his brain. The other character here is the gender unicorn. You may, you may have seen the gender unicorn before. He performs a similar role to the gender bread man. The little rainbow coming from his head tells you that his gender identity also lives in his head. It lives in his brain. So this is one possibility, right? Maybe the concept of gender identity relies on the existence of sexed or gendered brains. Does gender identity refer to masculine brains and feminine brains? Proponents of gender identity very rarely explicitly make this claim. But it's often lurking in the background. As you see with those pictures, it's often lurking in the background, even if it's not explicitly appeal, appealed to. So occasionally people will come out and say, I was assigned male at birth, but I have a female brain. You will sometimes hear people say that. But more, more often it's just alluded to, and for good reason, I think, because I think it's going to be very hard to argue for. Now, like I said at the start, I'm not qualified to pronounce on this. I'm not qualified to make definitive comments on the existence of or, or non-existence of sexed brains. I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> not one of my academic specialties. So I'm just a mere philosopher. That's all, so all I can do is I can highlight the kinds of logical arguments, the kinds of empirical claims that the brain of one sex in the body of another sex has to rely on. That's all I can do, is highlight what kinds of empirical claims are being made here. If we are to accept the idea that gender identity is a matter of people being born with the brain of one sex in the body of another, we have to accept both of the following two highly contested empirical claims. So it relies on two highly contested empirical hypotheses. The first one is that there are significant enough differences in the brains of female and male people to make the designation of female brain and male brain accurate and meaningful. That's the first claim. The second claim is that we have a plausible explanatory theory as to how the brain of one sex could somehow find its way in the body of the other. So even if that first claim were true, even, even if it were true that there is such thing as male brains and female brains, which as I understand the state of play in neuroscientific research, which I admit is poorly, but as I understand it, that claim is certainly not proved beyond contestation. There is, there is question about that. Even if it's true, we're still going to need some, ex, some plausible explanatory story for the second claim, right? Even if there are different, su such significant differences in the brain structures and activities of female and male people that it makes sense to talk about female brains and male brains, you're still going to need quite a big story to, ex to explain how a person can be born with a male body, male chromosomes, male reproductive or organs, and yet a female brain, or vice versa. Mm. But beyond those empirical claims, it seems to me we've got a deep, deeper problem with this idea, and that's a conceptual one. That conceptual claim is, why should we understand that brain as a female brain when it resides in a male body? And crucially, it's overseen the development of that male body. In the case of adults, it's directed a male puberty. So the claim that there are feminine brains and masculine brains boils down to the suggestion well, that there are certain cognitive skills, personality traits, behavioral dispositions that are correlated with biological sex for reasons that can be attributed to brain differences. 
difference. Now, as previously noted, that's far from established. But even if it were established, they would be patterns, right? There would be patterns we could expect to observe in the general population. And then we could make claims like Simon Baron Cohen likes to do. We could say female people are, on average, more likely to be empathizers, while male people are, on average, more likely to be systematizers. But it wouldn't follow from that general pattern that any empathizer we encounter is therefore by definition female, or that any systematizer we meet is therefore by definition male. We should expect to find individuals from both classes at both ends of the bell curve, plotting the normal distribution of behavioral traits and dispositions for members of that sex. That doesn't mean that those individuals are not members of that sex class. It simply means they don't exhibit the typical skills and dispositions and traits for that sex class. In other words, it's not clear why the existence of a supposedly feminine personality trait in a male body is sufficient to render that brain female so that we should now accept the person has a female brain in a male body. Surely it makes sense, more sense to say that this apparently feminine brain is nonetheless male because it resides in a male body. So to illustrate that point, here's my example. Let's take a comparison with height. I'm five foot ten, so that makes me taller than most women. I'm at one end of the bell curve for the distribution of heights for, for women. Most people who are the same height as me are men. But it would be very weird to say that because most people who are five foot ten are men, therefore I'm a man, right? Rather, I'm at just one end of that distribution of heights for female people. So if gender identity is referring to gendered brains, it's also making quite a strange conceptual claim. It's making this claim that brains that are, say, more empathetic than the average are female brains, while brains that are more, say, systematizing are male. But I don't understand why we would classify them in that way. Doesn't it make more sense to say that an empathetic brain in a male body is still a male brain precisely because it resides in that body? So I'm going to go back to this, the picture of Steffi we had earlier. Steffi saying, what do you mean? I've got boys' parts. Are you talking about my penis? because it's mine and I'm a girl, so it's a girl's penis. A friend of mine made an edit to this. Her counter, her challenge to Steffi was, what do you mean I have a girl's brain? I'm a boy. My brain is a boy's brain. Surely it makes just as much sense to go that way. What do you mean my personality is a girl's personality? I've got a male body. Therefore, I've got a boy's personality. So here we get to one of the key claims of gender identity it's set. Gender identity says, I don't like X, therefore I am not a man. Rather than saying, I don't like X, therefore not all men like X. But what thoughts, beliefs, feelings, emotions, tastes, or preferences can women have that men cannot? Or vice versa? Why would you assume that the presence of a particular set of tastes and dispositions means that one's brain is female, rather than assuming that it shows that male people can possess those tastes and dispositions too. So it's here I think we can see the doctrine of gender identity is inherently essentialist. It assumes that there are fixed personality types and it requires people to determine which of those personality types they most closely resemble. Rather than being comfortable enough to say, Human personality is complex and varied, and different personalities, different aptitudes, different behaviors can come in all sorts of bodies. So that's, I think, the issue with claiming that gender identity has a material basis. It amounts to the claim that people have gendered brains, and that's both empirically unsupported and conceptually weird. The only other option is to make the claim that gender identity is an immaterial property, and then you're basically just making the claim that gender identity means people have got masculine and feminine souls. You do sometimes hear that claim. Caitlin Jenner has said both. Caitlin Jenner has said both that she thinks she has a female brain and that she thinks she has a female soul. Now, I don't know whether people who say that are using the term metaphorically. They might mean it metaphorically or they might mean it literally. But whichever, while I respect your right to hold that belief, it is essentially a religious belief or a paranormal belief. And while I respect your right to conceive of, you that, of yourself in that way, I don't see why it needs any special legal protections. Your right to believe that you have a gendered soul should be, does not need to be, your right to believe that you have that gendered soul should be protected and respected, but your soul itself doesn't need any protection. 
Okay. Regardless, here, I, here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and wrap up because I've been talking for a long time. I want to get to the, what I think is the crux of the problem, the incoherence of gender identity here. Here's the big problem. Whether or not you're searching for gendered brain or whether or not you're searching for gendered soul, and whether or not that search is fruitful or not, attempts to locate the objective property that is gender identity is always going to run into this problem, which is why is that any less essentialist than defining men and women by their genitals? Current usages of the term man and woman, male and female, make reference to biological and physiological features, namely reproductive function. The proponent of gender identity will say, and I know because it's been said a lot to me, it's very essentialist to define women by their reproductive functions. It's very, it's very essentialist to define women by their vaginas and men by their penises. But I just don't see how it's any less essentialist to define men and women by the existence of some property in their brains, or even worse, a soul. So here's a little comic I think sums it up quite nicely. What we have here is one character saying, Look, trans women have female neuron numbers in their limbic nucleus. That's what makes them women. When the other one says, women have vaginas, the person says, oh my god, transphobia. <laughs> it's just not clear why. If you're searching for the material basis of the difference between men and women, well, we've got a pretty obvious one. The one we've been going on for all this time, right? It's just not clear why it would be any improvement on where we currently are to say that being a woman is determined by the existence of female neurons in the limbic nucleus, or any, rather than to say it's determined by having XX chromosomes, or having a uterus, having ovaries. So this gets us to the heart of the problem. Last couple of minutes, and then I'm going to stop, I promise. Here's a big problem. Proponents of gender identity want gender identity to be defined entirely subjectively. That is, they want it to be the case that people cannot ever be mistaken about their gender identity. The individual has to be the final and ultimate authority on what their gender identity is. It is bigoted and oppressive to even ask, to even ask questions about it, let alone not to believe it. Now, apart from the fact that doesn't actually fit in with other aspects of the doctrine, for example, the insistence that I have one when I claim that I don't, which is kind of, which is kind of weird, it doesn't fit with that view, right? I'm told that I have one, and when, but everyone, I say I don't have one, and everyone's supposed to be the final authority. I've had, we'll talk about this in the Q&A, but I've, this has happened, I've had this happen many times. So I wrote an article that had thousands of hits saying that I don't have a gender identity. I got an awful lot of responses telling me, yes, you do. You're, you, do, you identify as a woman. I was not permitted to say I'm not, I don't have one, right? I have, absolutely, absolutely, and that's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who hold this view. I'm not talking about all trans people. I'm certainly not talking about all transgender people. I'm talking about people who hold this doctrine. If you don't accept the claims here, then you are not one of the people I'm talking about because you are not a proponent of this doctrine. But this doctrine exists. There are people who hold it, and I know because they say these things to me. And they have said these things to me for the last couple of years. Right. Right. Can we, can we talk about this? There's going to be a Q&A, and, &A and I'll, take, I'll, I'll respond to all of this then, right? Proponents of this doctrine want it to be the case that people can never be wrong about their gender identity. They want it to be the case that you can never be mistaken. You're the final authority on your gender identity. But without any objective criteria, how can I possibly know whether I have this deeply felt, felt internal sense of my own identity? What might this even mean? How can I know if I have a deeply held internal personal experience of being a woman unless I know what the criteria for womanhood are and I know whether I meet them? Why would I even think that I am a woman unless I think that there's something objectively real, independent of my own feelings, that women are, and that I meet that definition? So on any objective criteria of womanhood, whether that's possession of a uterus, whether it's XX chromosomes, whether it's female neuron numbers in the limbic nucleus, I can say that the reason I'm a woman is because that's what it means to be a woman, those objective criteria, and I meet that, those criteria, I have that feature. But this allows that I might be mistaken about it. But at least the claim to identify as a woman would be coherent, right? It would actually be intelligible. But if we're unwilling to allow that an individual can ever be mistaken about their gender identity, if we're unwilling to allow that there might be any objective criteria at all about what it means to be a man or a woman, 
then claims to identify as a man or a woman become unintelligible. So without any objective criteria for womanhood, how can I possibly know whether I have this deeply felt, held internal personal sense of myself as a woman? What might that even mean? If, 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 if gender is defined entirely subjectively, the problem we run into is that gender becomes Wittgenstein's beetle in the box. What this basically means is, if we all have a box and we can only see into our own, and we all believe we have a beetle in our box, but we can't see what's in anybody else's boxes, and we can't compare whether the thing they have in their box is the same thing as I have in my box, then the word beetle becomes meaningless. We don't know what beetles are. I mean, there may be nothing in each other's boxes. The word beetle can no longer be the name of anything in the world. The same is true of the word man or the word woman here. If the, if the answer to the question, what is a woman, is someone who identifies as a woman, that's basically identical to answering the question, what is a schnargel? That's someone who identifies as a schnargel. If that's the definition of a schnargel, I'm going to ask you, are you a schnargel? How would you know? The point is, you wouldn't. I'm not going to talk about the political implications because I've talked for long enough. I'll leave it there. So the, the last thing, the only, the last con conclusion I want to come to, here's the kind of the, the logical conclusion of all of this. So if we take gender identity entirely subjectively, there becomes no way, either in principle or in practice, to determine men from women. So, you could find yourself, say, in a room, as, oh, I've lost one of my slides. The point is you could find yourself in a room with all of the people who are here today and be absolutely incapable of knowing who in this room is a man and who is a woman. There would be no way of determining it. You couldn't even make a reasonable guess because the only way to know would be to know the content of that person's subjective mental state, to know the content of that person's mind, and you cannot do that. As soon as that happens, men and women as political classes disappear. Men and women can no longer exist if you define gender entirely subjectively. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Well done. Thank you.